Okay, so in survival analysis, uh, we mainly consider two variables. They are the survival time t and then the um, censored or not censored, that is delta one or zero, right? So in addition to that, those two are two must be there in order to do a survival analysis. And in addition to that, you have to have, uh, uh, in addition to that, if you have other covariates, right? That means other variables that can affect the survival of the cohort, you can include them, right? And in order to get that information into your survival analysis, we use this proportional hazard model. It's uh, similar to the regression, multiple linear regression model, but not linear. Uh, so you can include several excess into your uh, survival uh, data, right? So uh, say, for example, we discussed um, gender, age, other medical history, um, family history, uh, treatment methods, right? So likewise, any variable that can affect the survival can be added into the model. And then by building a this Cox proportional hazard model, you can do comparisons, you can understand, or you can figure out what are the significant covariates for the survival model. And then you can do comparison among groups. You can compare hazards, you can calculate hazard rates, okay? So you can do several things using the Cox proportional hazard model, right? Uh, if you look at the names, uh, it is usually known as Cox pH model. Right. In addition to that, Fox pH, so pH for proportional hazard. Uh, Fox regression is another word. So as I mentioned, it's similar to the regression setup. Uh, and since we are using the survival analysis, uh, it's going to be non-parametric. And with the Cox regression, uh, it becomes semi-parametric. So it's a combination of parametric and non-parametric. So it's semi-parametric model, right? So sometimes it's called the semi-parametric proportional hazard. Then just the pH model or multiplicative hazard model. So those are, uh, they all correspond to the same thing, Fox pH model, right? Uh, this was introduced by Sir David Fox in 1972. Have you heard about Sir David Fox? No. Uh, he's an English mathematician or a statistician. He's the, uh, he's actually the uh, first statistician who won the International Prize in Statistics. Right? That was in 2016. That's when the prize was introduced, International Prize for Statistics. So, uh, so David Cox was the first one who received that prize, and that is for this um, his uh, survival analysis in biomedical sciences, including this uh, pH model. So that is why it's named as Cox pH model. Okay. So the reason we use Cox pH model because it allows the covariates to be included in the survival setting. Right. So these covariates can be continuous or categorical. Right. Now you can think about the examples we discussed. If it is like age, you can have continuous. Or if it is like uh, gender, so that will be categorical. Treatment methods will be categorical. If you include blood pressure levels, cholesterol levels, and so on, they will be continuous. Right. So these covariates can be continuous or categorical. Right. Uh, so it's very uh, analog to the logistic regression. Like you compare the odds ratios, you can compare the hazard ratios in Fox pH model. Okay. So if you have any questions, please uh, use the chat or you can unmute and speak up. Okay. Right. Uh, so these are the notations that we are using in the Fox pH not model. Mm -hmm. uh, so we use the Kaplan-Meier survival function, uh, the same notation here, right? 
So you have to have the T and the delta. So Tj is the time, uh, the time measurement you record or the survival time for each individual J, so Tj. Then the censored uh, value is the one or zero, since that is the Dj, right? So this is delta, Dj is delta. And then Xj, those are the covariates for each individual that you measure, like the other variables, age, uh, gender, blood pressure levels, right? So whatever the other variables that you include, they will be Xj, right? Uh, and sometimes, if these covariates are depending on time, we go for xjt. So these are your x becomes a function of t. Okay, so we come to that in the uh, fifth chapter. These are called the time-dependent uh, Fox model or extensions of the Fox model, right? So we look at this uh, this complicated model in chapter five, right? Uh, in the original Cox pH model, these covariates, they are time independent, right? So these are time independent. That means the values of X should not change over time, right? If they change over time, that is a violation of the model, right? So uh, the proportional hazard model, we call them pH assumptions, proportional hazard assumptions. So one assumption is this covariates should be time independent. They should not depend on time. If they depend on time, you can't build up the Cox pH model. It's a violation of assumptions. In such situations, go, you go for this XJT type model, which is the uh, extended Cox model, right? So we look at it later. But now for Cox pH model, you have the time value, you have delta, and then you have this additional X, they should be time independent. Right? right, so here's the model of the, uh, the Fox pH, uh, here, the equation for the Fox pH model, right? So this is a hazard model. So you have the function H, right? So your left-hand side, you have the hazard function. It depends on two things, T and X, right? T is the time and X. Xs are the variables, okay? So you have your left-hand side, this is the uh, proportional hazard equation, HTX, right? So in the right-hand side, you have the equation for that. Actually, it contains two parts. The first part is H naught T, which, which we call the baseline hazard, right? The baseline hazard, it's, it's uh, it depends on T, so because you, it's a function of T. Right? The baseline hazard is a function of t, but independent of x. Right, So you don't see x in h naught t. In h, you see both t and x. But in h naught, you only see t. So the baseline hazard only depends on time t, but not on x's. So, it, so the baseline hazard is independent of x, but dependent on t. Okay. Now, there's no need of knowing the actual function of this baseline hazard. The reason is, after we um, model the Fox pH, the equation, what we use it is to calculate the hazard ratios, right? HR, the hazard ratios. So when you do that, this baseline hazard will cancel out, right? So this H0 T is going to vanish somewhere uh, in between the process. Therefore, it's not necessary to know the exact form of H0. You just know that it is a uh, hazard function, which we call the baseline hazard. Okay. Uh, the distribution of it, the properties of it, we, we are not uh, interested about it because it will be gone at the end. Okay. The second part is the exponential term, right? Or e to the power term. So you can write it if you want. You can write it like this, e to the power. What do you have here? sum of beta i xi. So this is like the regression function. You have the coefficient betas and the covariant x's. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so what you see here is starting from i1 to p, for whatever the number of x's you have, you have the uh, beta 1 x1 plus beta 2 x2 plus beta 3 x3 up to beta p xp. So it's the sum of bi xi. So e to the power sum of bi xi, that is the exponential term. So in this exponential term, what do you see? You see these x's, but you don't see t. You don't see any 
where any T letter in the EXP function, right? So the EXP part, the second part or the exponential part, it depends on X, but independent from T, okay? So what are the, the main properties? Your hazard function or the or Cox, proportional, Cox proportional hazard model contains two parts. First is the baseline hazard, which is dependent on T, but independent from X. Second part is, part is the exponential part, which is dependent of X, but independent from T. Okay, right, so those are the, oh, this is how your model looks like. So now, uh, whenever you have to write down the, the Fox pH model, and after you write this equation 3.1, always you have to make sure to note down what this H naught T and what is this EXP, right? at least H naught T, otherwise it's not complete. So you have to mention where H naught T is the arbitrary baseline hazard, right? So that should be there. And then explain beta is the regression coefficients and xi are the xi are the time independent covariates, right? So we have to mention each and every term of your model, right? So don't just write this equation 3.1 and finish off. When you have to write the Fox pH model, right? Especially when you know the situation, you, you know excess, how many P's are there. So you will write the exact equation. When you do examples, you'll see that. Always you have to mention H naught T is the arbitrary baseline hazard and beta are the, uh, co the regression coefficients and X as the time dependent, uh, sorry, time independent covariates. Okay. So that will be the complete explanation of the Fox pH model. Right. So is it clear how this model is written? If you want, you can write it like this, e to the power. But when you have a, a lengthy equation, you know, writing it e to the power, the superscript, uh, rather than writing it like that, writing it exp and it in parentheses uh, will be easy and better. Okay. Right. So this is how we write the basic Fox pH model. Right. And the most important thing is checking the pH assumption. Right. So if any of the, the assumptions are violated, you can't uh, build up the Fox pH model, okay? So that's similar to the regression, right? So there are assumptions that you have to check after you fit the regression model, the error terms, the normality, uh, equal variance, zero mean, right? So you have all these uh, properties or assumptions that you must test. If they are violated, you have to either transpose the, uh, the data set Right? So you have to do some remedies and then build the model again and make sure the assumptions are satisfied. So similar to that, in Fox pH model also, you must check these pH assumptions. Right? So what are the pH assumptions? The first one, the baseline hazard is a function of T but does not involve X. So that's the first thing. Right? That is the H naught T, the baseline hazard. Okay, so this is H naught T. See, it's, it's independent of X, right? But a function of T. So that's the first thing. Then the second thing, the EXP term involves Xs, but does not involve T, right? So that also uh, we checked. That means these Xs are time independent, right? So that's why it's called Xs does not involve T, okay? So the EXP term involves X, but not T. The reason is Xs are time independent, right? So when you fit a model, you have to make sure uh, this time independence is there before you fit the model, right? Now, you know, there are certain variables we already know, right? According to the, the natural way they are presented. Okay, these variables are independent of time. These variables are dependent of time. Right? So you can see some examples here for both time independent and dependent variables. Right? Say, for example, if you look at uh, uh, the variables like gender. Right? So uh, nowadays there can be changes, but anyways, if you think about the usual situation, uh, gender is uh, not changing over the time for a person. 
blood type, right? So when you were born with a certain blood type, it will be there until you die, right? So blood type does not uh, change over time. So it is time independent. Then age at diagnosis, right? So you report the age when you first diagnose a certain disease. So that age, it's not going to change, right? Your age will change, but age at diagnosis, it's going to be there, uh, a fixed value, right? And then if you look at the time dependent variables, there are many. If you think about the usual age, it always change with time, every minute, every time, every day, right? Yeah, age changes over time. Uh, weight of a person, right? It, it fluctuates, can go up and down. So it's not going to be a fixed value over the time. If you think about a follow-up period of three or five years per set of patients, obviously the weight is going to change over the time, right? They can increase or decrease here and there, right? Then there are health factors like cholesterol level, the blood glucose, uh, blood, blood pressure levels, right? So all these health factors will change over the time. Smoking habit, another one. Maybe uh, the, the patient was smoking at the beginning and somewhere in the between he quit, right? And maybe again he started, right? So there can be several patterns for uh, such habits, okay? Also the beetle chewing, right? So there can be variables which change over the time during the follow-up period, okay? So they are called time-dependent variables. So you cannot include time-dependent variables in your Cox-PH model right? Uh, actually, you can test it, right? Even though you include these variables in your model, you can test it whether they violate, violate the pH assumption or not. Even from graphs, you can uh, understand it and then you have to do certain uh, remedies to make them either time independent or modify your model so that the time dependent variables can be included like that extensions, right? Okay. <clears throat> Now, in addition to the variables I was talking about, can you also give me a few examples for time-dependent and time-independent variables? Think about some examples. Let's start with time-independent variables. Can any of you give examples for time-independent variables? You don't have to think about the a clinical setup, right? Any other example? We, we have discussed several examples for the last two weeks. So you can think about them and can you give me some examples for time independent variables? Uh, I color, yes, I color is time independent, right? So uh, unless you wear uh, those cosmetic colored lenses, right? Uh, I color is time independent, yes. Any any other examples? The birth rate, if you are <clears throat> doing a, a research on newborn babies or so, birth rates, birth uh, length. Right? So those are fixed, right, for a person. What is the weight at the birth, right? Mm. Now, what about time-dependent variables? There are many, right, if you can think about. There can be many examples that you can come up with. You can give me a, another example for time dependent variable. Just think about 
Level of education, yes. Income of a person, heart rate, yeah. All of them are. Let's write them down. Level of education, it always adds up, right? Level of education, heart rate changes very frequently over the time. Income level, of course. Right? <clears throat> Hair growth, temperature, I think, I, I guess it's the body temperature, right? Hair growth. Yeah, so you can come up with different uh, variables like that. Okay. So now you'll understand what are the time independent and time dependent variables, right? So when you are including these variables in your model, you can, as a start, you can include uh, them, all of them, right, without worrying, and then you can uh, check for pH assumption, right? With the p-value, we can check the pH assumption, and if they violate, if, if they are time dependent, it will be they are, it, it will be indicated uh, based on the p-value, right? You know, sometimes uh, in a given uh, for a given cohort in a given time period, there can be certain variables, although they are time dependent within that study period, they are not changing, right? So there can be certain variables, although naturally they are time dependent, during our follow-up period for those selected patients, it's not changing all the time, right? So such in such situations, uh, although naturally they are time dependent, for your model, they will be time independent, right? So that, those things we can check with the pH assumption, right? With the p-value and so. Uh, so we'll look at them um, in the coming slides, right? Okay. <clears throat> now let's look at uh, the Cox model in detail. Now you all know how to write the uh, Cox model. So you write, here's the model, HTX equals the baseline has add then EXP, beta 1, X1, beta 2, X2, up to beta P, XP. P is the number of variables. Okay? Right. <clears throat> now, if all these Xs are 0, what will happen? If X1 is 0, X2 is 0, and XP is 0, all of them are 0, then what do you have? You have h naught d to the power 0, right? e to the power 0 is 1. So your model becomes the just the baseline hazard. So if all x's are 0, then what will happen? Your h t x becomes just h naught t because this goes to 1. Okay? Right. The other thing is this is h naught t is unspecified as I mentioned earlier. And we don't worry about it, right? It doesn't matter. Uh, and that is what it makes the Cox pH model a semi-parametric model, right? Semi-parametric, that means, well, maybe there's a, a underlying distribution for H naught T, maybe not, we don't know, right? So we don't care. So that makes our Cox model a semi-parametric model, right? Now you can derive the maximum likelihood estimate for the Cox pH model, right? I'm not going to do it. It's a, a detailed one, uh, but you can do it, right? So I'll upload some extra reading, mat reading material for this um, uh, estimating the uh, likelihood for the Cox pH model. You can read it later, okay?
Right. So the next section is after building up your model, how are we going to compute or how are we going to use this model, right? The main purpose is to figure out the hazard ratios, right? <clears throat> so we are going to compare the hazards. You can do it between two different patients or two different groups of patients, right? Especially, now can you think about the, the examples we did? Uh, there was an example where we uh, had two groups. We compared the survival, the placebo group and the treatment group, right? So you can compare the, the survival or the other way around, that is the hazard, right? The opposite of the survival is the hazard. So you can compare the survival or the hazard between these two groups. Or you can compare survival or hazard of two different patients with different excess. Right? So with the examples, we'll see how to calculate these hazards, right? So this is very similar to the odds. So you are going to explain this patient has, let's say five times hazard, then say patient A has five times hazard than patient B to expose to a certain disease, something like that. So the patient A must have different set of values for his core variants. Uh, patient B may have different set of values for his own excess, right? Now, or if you compare the survival between, let's say, gender, you may say uh, male patients have, say, two times hazard to expose to the disease compared to the female patients. Now, there you are comparing two groups. Right? So you have these options. Either you can compare individuals, right, based on their hazard, or you can compare two or more groups. Right? So that depends on the way you are using your model. Right? So that is the main goal to compute the hazard ratios. Right? Now these excess, as I mentioned, they can be quantitative or qualitative. Right? That means you have numerical or categorical. Right? So if you have uh, quantitative, right, continuous variables like age, blood sugar level, cholesterol level, and so on, uh, you have to be careful about the unit of measurement you use, right? If you measure in kilograms for weight, you, they all should have the same uh, measurement unit. Uh, if it is the blood sugar level, whatever the unit of measurement you use, all the patients in the cohort should have the same unit of measurement, right? Sometimes there can be transformations like log, log values, right? So usually you will see log transformations because this we are dealing with the exponential function, right? You know, sometimes the linear uh, variables, you may have to transform to log in order to get a better model, right? So sometimes the counts will be transformed to log, log counts, okay? Uh, then if there are qualitative or categorical variables, they can be ord ordinal, nominal, right? Uh, and your own coding may be there, right? So usually the nominal variables like gender, male, female, and so on. Uh, ordered, you can have high, low, moderate, where you have uh, the groups in natural order, right? And you know, sometimes age, if it is continuous, you can convert it into categories, uh, like 25 to 35, 36 to 45, and so on. You're on 40, right? So rather than using age as a continuous variable, you can define categories or maybe uh, teenagers, adults, seniors, likewise, right? So that is also possible, right? You can define uh, the continuous variables or convert them into categorical variables. Uh, in such, in, if you, when you do that, it's very easy to compare the groups, right? Because your age, again, if you divide them into several group, groups, then hazard ratio comparison is easy. Right, with the categorical variables rather than uh, continuous variables. Okay. Right. Now, how are we going to compare the hazard? Right. Uh, first, we'll look at the notation and the equations, then we'll apply it to a, uh, an example and see it. Okay. Right. <clears throat> now, this is an example where you are trying to find the hazard ratio. You are comparing it with one individual with another individual. That means, let's say, patient A and patient B, right? 
So what are we going to do is, you use the estimated hazard function. What does that mean? So your H, we write down the function for you. So here's our H T X, right? So we build up a model. Suppose we have Let's see, three variables, right? So beta one, x one, beta two, x two, plus beta three, x three. Suppose you have this model. <clears throat> so you have a set of, let's say, 50 patients, right? So using these 50 patients, for them, you'll have altogether how many variables? You have their survival time, you have their delta value, then you have x1, x2, and x3, right? So your data set contains them, okay? So when you build up the model, you'll end up with estimated beta values for x1, x2, and x3, right? So then your model becomes the hat, right? Using the data set, when you build up the model, like you do in regression analysis, these are the estimated coefficients. Right? So from the model, you can figure out those coefficients. Right? Then for a given patient, okay, let's say for patient A, suppose this X1 is age, this is gender, and this is cholesterol level. Right? So for a selected patient, you can record the age, you can record the gender, you can record the cholesterol level. Gender, let's say, female one, male zero, right? You can do that. So you can, you know the numbers for beta one, beta two, and beta three. Those will be, there will be values calculated from the model, right? So there will be numbers for beta one hat, beta two hat, and beta three hat. Then for a given person, you know that person's age, you know that person's gender, maybe one or zero, you know that person's cholesterol level. So by including that, you can calculate a number for this EXP term you'll end up with a, a value, right? You have H naught T also at the front. So that is for the, let's say patient A. You can do the similar calculation for the second patient, let's say patient B. You get that patient's age, gender and cholesterol level and multiply them with the corresponding uh, betas, the values you get from the model. So you'll get E to the power some number. So for there also, you'll get a certain value, right? So you have H hat TX star, that's let's say for patient A, and H hat TX is the notation for patient B. So you, when you divide these two, what will happen? When you divide these two, what will happen? The baseline hazard will cancel out, right? You have H naught T EXP some number for A, you have H naught T some number for B, top and the bottom. So from top H naught T to bottom H naught T, it will cancel out. So you will end up with just one number in, in the numerator, another number in the denominator, you can divide it and get a certain value. That is the hazard ratio between the two individuals you are comparing. Okay? So that's simple mathematics that we are going to do here, right? If this H naught T X star, that means the one at the top, the numerator, is bigger than the denominator value, you will get a number greater than one, right? So you'll get a number greater than one, and this is the division. So it's like five divided by three or something, right? So usually it's easy to interpret the hazard ratio when you have a value greater than one, right? Uh, so if you get say 2.78, you can say patient A has approximately three times hazard compared to patient B, likewise. But if you get a, a decimal value, that is when the numerator value is smaller than the denominator value. It's like this, 1 over 0.2 or something. Uh, sorry, the other way around, right? So 1 over 0.2 is 5. This is easy to explain. But if you have a uh, smaller value at the top and the uh, low, uh, and a bigger value at the bottom, and you'll end up with a hazard ratio like this, 0 0.2. It's, it's not, uh, you can interpret, you can say patient A has 0 0.2 times hazard compared to patient B, but that does not give a clear meaning. And if you do it other way around, if you reverse patient B to A, that will be one over 0.2, right? That is five times. Then you can say 
Patient B has five times hazard compared to patient A. So rather than saying patient A has 0.2 times hazard than patient B, you can say patient B has five times hazard than patient A. Is that clear? What you do is you just switch top and bottom. Right? So you look at the hazard ratio you get. If it is less than one, you know, interpreting it, it's not that much uh, informative. So you switch top and bottom. And then you compare not A to B, you compare B to A. Right? That's very simple. Uh, and you'll see when we do examples, you can very easily do that and go on with your interpretation. Right? You don't have to do anything into the model. Just the final answer, you take it one over or switch top and bottom. That's it. Right? So here, the, in this example, we compared one patient to the other one. Right? But you can compare two groups, like you have set of patients, all of them have the same agenda and cholesterol level. Another set with different age group, same gender, same cholesterol levels. In that case, you are comparing two patients groups of different ages. Right? So you can say age group, this age group has this many times as that compared to that age group, likewise, right? So likewise, you can compare hazard ratio either between two people or two individuals or between groups, right? So we can do that very easily with the model you built, okay? Right. So here's the, uh, the equation in detail. So at the top, you have h hat tx, you have the baseline hazard and the exponential function for that, uh, let's say patient A, right? And then at the bottom, you have the same set for patient B, and you can see H naught T is going to cancel out, right? So this is gone. And since you have the same base, E to the power, when you have the division, what can you do? You can do the subtraction to the uh, exponent, right? So rather than like writing EXP, the sum of beta i x i divided by E X P sum of beta hat x i, uh, beta hat i x i, what you can do is you can take the common base exp and subtract this part by this part. So you have beta i hat common, and that's you got from the model. So it will be just x i star minus x i. That means value for patient A minus value for patient B. So the, these calculations become very, very easy actually. Okay. So easier than you think when you look at these equations. Right. So the baseline hazard cancel out and the hazard ratio becomes C equation 3.3. So that is what we are going to use from the build up model. Okay. <clears throat> so when you actually do the calculations, if you want, you can straight away start from this equation. But if you think uh, it's more clear to you, write in the hazard ratio with the original uh, h hat t x star h hat t x that is for the two groups separately write down the equations cancel hazard note and then write down 3.3 that is also okay right? that's more clear right when you do calculations right mm. so here's a and small example to show you how to calculate the hazard ratio okay now, in this model, you have only one predictor. Now, if I'm too fast and if you need any extra explanation, please stop me and let me know, All right? Do you have any questions? So here's an example uh, with only one predictor variable, P1, right? So if it is P1, can you take out, a, uh, you know, your notes and write down how will the proportional hazard model look like? How will your proportional hazard look like? Take piece of paper and write down the model. Only one x, only one for variable, only one predictor variable. And that variable is treatment type.
You can type it in the chat, you can do that. See whether you can get this one. That's it, right? That's it. Just X1. Or if you want, X1 it's the treatment type. You can indicate it like this. Baseline has had times EXP. Beta 1, let's say TRT for treatment. And when it is the estimated one, it will be this. Right? So this beta 1 will have a value. If you feed the data set and run the Fox pH model, you will find the uh, value for this question. Right? Now, suppose this treatment has two levels. They say treatment type 1 and uh, X1 for treatment type 2. So X1 contains two possible values, 0 and 1. That's it. Okay. So if you want to compare the hazard ratio between patients who were in treatment type 2 to the patients who are in treatment type 1. So 0 for treatment type 1 and 1 for treatment type 2. So you are comparing type 2 to 1. So type 2 will be in the numerator at the top. Okay, so there's order, right? Comparing type 2 to type 1. So type 2 should be at the top, type 1 should be at the uh, denominator, right? So how do you write it? So when you write down the HR, right, the hazard ratio, that will be H0 hat T EXP beta 1 hat. What is the treatment? Treatment type 2 is x equals 1. So this x1 becomes 1. Just beta 1 times 1. Right? Then you divide it by h not hat t for the treatment type 1. exp same beta 1 hat. Now what is the value of x? x is 0 for treatment type 2. So this becomes 0. Right, so H not cancels out. So what you have for the hazard ratio, see? What you have for the hazard ratio is EXP beta 1 hat, right? It's common, 1 minus 0, right? At the top and the bottom, right? So the common, common uh, base EXP, so you subtract the exponents. Division becomes the subtract. So beta 1 hat times 1 minus 0 is just 1. So the answer is EXP beta 1 hat. Or you can write this as e to the power beta 1 hat. Right? So the hazard ratio uh, is whatever that value you get from e to the power beta 1 hat. Okay? So you can compare. After looking at the number you get for that, you can say treatment. the patients in treatment type 2 has this many hazards compared to the patients who had treatment time one. So that is how you explain it, right? <clears throat> so the notation becomes HR hat, that is for the 
hazard ratio. Right? So you divide top and the bottom. So always the top becomes by looking at the way you have to compare treatment time two to treatment type one. That is the comparison. If you are comparing treatment type one to treatment type two, right, then type one value should go to the numerator, type two value should go to the denominator. Okay. So be careful with the wording you use. Right. So that's all you have to do with the hazard ratios. Right. Now the next one. If you have two predictor variables, what will happen? And here's the hazard ratio. Can you derive it? Okay, let me write it here. If we have two predictor variables. Okay. So that means you have x1 and x2. Shall we give some names? Let's say you are dealing with the set of patients. x1 is the gender and x2 blood glucose level, okay? Can you write down the Fox pH model for this one, this scenario? Baseline hazard, EXP, beta 1, let's say DEN for gender, plus beta 2, blood glucose level. Now, sometimes these coefficients can be plus or minus, okay? So, and depending on that, your plus may be minus, right? That, that comes from the value of the beta, right? So, your estimated beta can be plus positive or negative, right? And then the estimated one, oh, this is the estimated model. Now let's compare two patients, right? Patient one, let's say the gender, female one, male zero, uh, blood glucose level is it's a continuous variable, right? Patient one is female with blood glucose level, let's say 140, whatever the measurement, okay? Just an, uh, an arbitrary number, don't worry much, right? And the patient two is, let's say, a male with blood glucose level, let's say, again, 140. Patient three is a female with blood glucose level, 210, right? Patient four, A male with blood glucose level, or let's say another female, blood glucose level, something like this, okay? 
Now you want to compare the hazard, right? When you compare the hazard, the opposite is the survival, right? So both, both are there, okay? Now for this data, right? Can you find the hazard or do the comparison or can you find the hazard trait between Let's find the hazard trait between patient one and patient two. Can you write it? Write it like this, hazard ratio estimated. At the top, you can write this function for female blood glucose level, right? And then for patient two, male blood glucose level is there. Try to write down the top and the bottom. Then you'll see how we can calculate the hazard ratio. Female, gender is one plus beta two hat, equals level 140. At the bottom, same H naught hat, EXP, beta one hat, male, it is zero, beta two hat, 140. So what will be the answer? EXP, let's do the division, the top and the bottom, the common EXP. Beta 1 hat, 1 minus 0 plus beta 2 hat, 140 minus 140. So what is the answer? This becomes 0. You get EXP, beta 1 hat times 1, just beta 1 hat. So the hazard ratio between patient 1 and patient 2 will be e to the power beta 1 hat. Okay. So how do you explain or how do you interpret this hazard ratio? Right. Suppose you got just a number, right? Average. Suppose, suppose you got 3.8. According to whatever the beta value, suppose you got 3.8. What does that mean? You can interpret it as the hazard of a patient, a hazard of a female patient with blood glucose level 140 has approximately 3.8 times hazard compared to a male patient with the same blood glucose level. Right? So that is how you explain it. The hazard of female patient with blood glucose level 140 is 3.8 times compared to a, a male patient with same Blood glucose level. Now this 3.8, I'll just write a number to explain, right? It can be any value depending on beta. Now is that clear how you do the calculation and how you interpret? Okay. Now likewise, can you compare um, two and three? Compare two and three. Patient two 
to patient three. So write down the equations as a ratio and then find a, an expression for the HR. So how do you write it? You are comparing patient two to patient three, right? So the hazard ratio So patient two is male. Shall we write down the value? Male is zero, right? Plus beta one hat, and then forty. That's the top. Then patient three, beta one hat. Uh, she's a patient three is female with glucose level two ten. Okay, now what happens? EXP, beta 1 hat, go to the subtraction, 0 minus 1 plus beta 2 hat, 140 minus 2 t. So what do you get? EXP, beta 1 hat, negative. Right? Negative beta 1 hat was 0 minus 1 negative. 140 minus 210 is again negative. This is the value. 70 beta 2 hat. So when you know the values of beta 1 hat, beta 2 hat, you can find this number. Okay? Is this clear to all of you? I will write down the hazard ratio and then get the value. Yes or no? Anything unclear? Okay, so can you try patient three and four? Patient three and four. So write down the equation and you can give me the answer, put into the chat.
patient three to patient four. Okay, come do the comparison. So I want the answer for the expression. You can either unmute and uh, give me the answer, or you can put it into the chat. Right? You don't have to read you know, to not type the symbols. Just you can type B for beta. Okay, B one, B two for beta. I got four or five answers. Others also, please share it.
Nadana, correct, Rashmi. Okay. Uh, Nithananda. Check the sign. Plus or minus. Arundi, check the sign. Tarindu, you don't have beta 1 there. You cannot have beta 1. Akila, correct. Shashri, correct. Ah, Siri, okay. Okay, let's see. So how do you write this? Hazard ratio, estimate, estimated hazard ratio. Why estimated? Because your beta has to be estimate, right? From the data set. Now you see, uh, with the practice, since H naught T cancels out, you can straight away write down this equation, right? This is 3.3. .3. So if you want, you can omit this first step and straight away write this uh, equation. But if you think it's, um, you know, you want, don't miss anything, right? better to start from the beginning and do it, right? So patient uh, three is female. Cholesterol level is 210, right? And patient four is again female. And cholesterol level is 250. Am I right? Female, 250. So this cancels out. EXP. Beta 1 hat, 1 minus 1. Plus beta 2 hat, 210 minus 250. So 1 minus 1 is 0, so this is gone. So it is just EXP. 210 minus 250 is negative 40 beta 2. Right? So that's what you get. Negative 40 beta 2. Hat. Right? So how do you explain it? Patient 3 has, right? So whatever the number, this many times has had um, compared to, uh, or you can say, a female, a female patient with blood glucose level 210 has this many times as hard compared to another female with blood glucose level 250, right? So what, what you can see from these examples is when you have the same value, same uh, value for your covariate, that beta is going to cancel out. So females both, beta 1 goes away because it's 1 minus 1, 0. If the cholesterol levels are same, like this one, 140, 140, so that coefficient goes away, right? So whenever you have common values for excess, you can simply omit them from your equation because they are going to be zero, right? So with practice, you'll see that whenever you see similar values for the covariates, you can forget them in your uh, hazard ratio equation. They are going to be zero, right? So just use only the different ones and that is just the subtraction, right? Subtraction from the first, the first one to the second one, right? So that is how you get the hazard ratio. Okay. Now, is it clear to all of you how you do the comparison, how you write down the hazard function, and how you calculate the hazard ratio and so on? So now, what if you want to compare patient four? to patient three. You just switch top and bottom. So in that case, what will be the HR hat? If you want, you can just do the final answer one minus, or sorry, one over the reciprocal, right? Beta two hat, one over this answer, or that will be simply EXP, Beta 1 hat, 1 minus 1, this is 1 minus 1, plus beta 2 hat, 250 minus 2. Two. So what will happen? EXP, beta 1 hat, uh, cancel, this goes away, uh, sorry, this 1 minus 1, this goes away, so you'll end up with EXP 40. Which, 
right? So you know that when you have negative exp values and it's positive, uh, that is the reciprocal and you'll have either decimal values or more than one values, right? So that's how it happens. So then you can compare patient four to patient three, the other way around, okay? So you can always use that trick if you end up with a hazard ratio less than one. So doing a comparison with the decimal value, it's not that much uh, you know, easy to understand. So better to get the reciprocal. So that will give you more than one times, right? And then doing that comparison this many times than the other one, right? So that will be better. Right. So I guess it's clear to you how to use the hazard function and then calculate the hazard ratios, okay? Right. So these are the properties of the hazard ratio. So we are actually doing the proportional hazards, right? Proportionately, the ratios, right? Since we are using time uh, independent excess, the value that you calculate, it's did not depending on time, right? Because you are using excess, which are not depending on T, right? So that means your hazard that you compute, it's constant over time, right? That's constant over time. That's depending on the assumption that you have time independent covariates or time independent excess, right? Okay, so this is just an example. We already did several examples, right? Okay. So let's try a, a, an example with exact values, right? With an output. I hope you can see the example, right? This is the leukemia remission data set, right? So read the description first. Okay. So read the description first. And then let's try to look at the model and explain, right? Okay. So what do you see here? You have the remission time data, right? So you have the T values. What is the other variable you have? You have T and with the pluses, those are the censored observation, right? So that means uh, the delta also, you know, right? So the first, uh, all the, the T values without plus, they are delta one. And with the plus, they are delta zero, right? So the censored observations. So what is the additional data you have? That is the log W V C value. So you have only one covariate X, okay? So there are 21 patients in each group. Group one is the treatment group, group two is the placebo. And the other variable is log WBC, that is the log value of the white blood cell count. Okay, so that is a, uh, an indicator of leukemia, white blood cell count, it, when it increases, that is 
the prop that is uh, an indicator of leukemia, right? So you have the log value, so it's a transformed value, log value of, a, of the white blood cell count for each and every patient is there, right? <clears throat> so the, the basic objective of this study is to find, or uh, they are going to compare the survival of the two groups. What are the two groups? Those who got the treatment and those who uh, didn't get the treatment. Between them, whether there is an effect of the log WBC also, right? So in addition to the treatment, will there be different outcomes if, depending on the patient's white blood cell count value, okay? Right, so the explanation is there. And there's another variable, uh, sorry, since we have the treatment, we have to include the treatment group also, right? So the X1 is the group status, that is uh, whether it's the treatment group or not, right? And X2 is the log WBC value, right? Right. So group two is the placebo, group one is the treatment. Okay. Right. Now, suppose you fit the model for this data, right? And also you can check the, check the interaction, right? So you can check whether there is an interaction effect also, whether there's an interact, whether there's an effect due to the treatment, whether there's an effect due to the uh, white blood cell count and whether there's an effect due to both. That's the interaction. So all these things you can uh, check using the FOXPH model. So that's very similar to the uh, regression analysis, right? Right. <clears throat> so the computer results for this data is here, right? So there are three models. Now look at these three models. Model one, model two, and model three. In the first model, now we look at the you can each and every column later. The model one contains only one variable, that is the X1 treatment variable, Rx for treatment variable, whether treated or placebo. Model two contains both X1 and X2, that is the treatment variable and log WBC value. Model three contains treatment variable log WBC value, and then their interaction effect, the interaction, okay? So we have three models, okay? So using FOXPH, that using R, we can very easily build this, right? It's very similar to building the multiple linear regression with, uh, you know, adding variables, you know, stepwise method. You add one variable, you add two variables, then you check the interaction like this, okay? Right. So let's look at the model one and I'll explain each and every column, right? So what is the first one? First column is the coefficient. That is the beta hat values, the coefficient. So the coefficient for the treatment. So this is beta one. In this model, beta one is 1.509. Then you have the standard error of the coefficient, right? So that's similar to the regression. You see, you always see the coefficient. It's standard error, right? And degrees of freedom and so on. So this standard error, you can use it to construct confidence intervals, and they are already calculated here, right? Then the set score to test the significance of this coefficient, right? The set score to test the significance and its p-value. So p-value 0, 0.000 means this uh, treatment has a significant effect onto the model, right? So that means, so this is where you test the hypothesis beta one hat equals zero versus beta one hat not equal to zero, right? I'll show you the test statistic later, right? So here P value 0, 0 0.00 means at, let's say at alpha 5%, we reject H naught. Rejecting H naught means beta one hat is not zero, so there's a significant value for that, right? So there is a significant treatment effect in this model. And you have the hazard ratio. 
Now, can you guess how you get this hazard ratio? How do you get this hazard ratio? In this model, we have only Rx, that is the treatment group. Treatment has two groups, placebo and uh, the treatment group and the placebo group. How did you get this 4.523? We have calculators, you can check it. Think about the hazard ratios you have calculated. Anybody who figured out how you got this 4.523? That is the e to the power coefficient. Yes, none of that's correct. Why? You use this model to compare the two groups, right? So you have two groups. They will be the treatment 1 and 0, right? So this is the treatment group. This is the uh, placebo group, right? And when you find the hazard ratios, you get... H0 cancels out EXP beta 1 hat 1 minus 0, which is EXP beta 1 hat. So if you take e to the power beta 1 hat, what is beta 1 hat? 1 1.509. That is the 4.523. Okay, now you can check it with your uh, calculators, right? So your coefficient, e to the power coefficient is your hazard ratio. Okay, and this 95% confidence interval is for the hazard ratio. How do you find it? You find the confidence interval for coefficient, right? 1.509, that will be 1.509. Now let's assume um, normality uh, for 95%, it will be 1.96 times the standard error 0 0.410. Okay. Let's just assume normality here. If not, you have to use the t-score with degrees of freedom in minus one. For now, just assume 1.96 and find this uh, confidence interval for the coefficient. One 1.509. The lower bound is negative 1.96 times the standard error 0.410. Lower bound, you will get 0 0.7054. Right? Can you get this lower bound? 0 0.7054. Similarly, find the upper bound 1.59 plus 1.96 times the standard error 0.410. You will get 2.3936. Now from this, how do you get this 95% confidence interval for hazard ratio? 2.0270.094. Do the same trick. You, you know the uh, you know the uh, relationship between coefficient and hazard ratio now. So do the same trick. How do you get this one? And how do you get this one?
Yes, you make the confidence interval e to the power, e to the power, right? So you take e to the power lower bound 0 0.7054 and e to the power 2.3936. You get the lower bound and the upper bound for the confidence interval for hazard ratio, right? So how do you get this one? e to the power 1.509. Right. So all these things are there in your output. If not, you can find them, right? Because you know the um, calculation, right? Right. So when you look at an output for a given model, this is the simplest one, model one, with only one covariate. You get the coefficient, you get its standard error. You can check the p-value, the test statistic. From that, you can check whether the coefficient is significant or not. In model one, that coefficient is significant. Then you can find the hazard ratio e to the power coefficient. Right? So how do you explain that hazard ratio 4.523? What is your hazard ratio? That hazard ratio, you are comparing patients who got the treatment to patients who had the placebo. Right? So how do you explain that hazard ratio? You can say patients who had the treatment Oh, they have 4.5. That's correct. Or oh, is it the other way around? Let's double check. Maybe placebo is uh, one and the other group zero is in there. Group mm. status E. How do you explain E one or zero? Is it there? Just those who got the treatment should have higher survival, right? That means lower hazard. Let's see. I haven't indicated. Okay, so they have used one and two. Okay, so let's pick, let's go with that. So. Okay, so let's do it again. Mm. They use treatment one and placebos two. Right? So treatment one and placebos two. So here you have two to one. That means you are comparing placebo to treatment, right? So two minus one, one. That is how you got this e to the beta one hat, right? 1 minus 2 is negative, but you are comparing placebo to treatment, so it will be 2 minus 1. Okay, I switch top and the bottom, right? So this is, at the top you have the placebo group, at the bottom you have the treatment group. Then you can get 2 minus 1, beta 1 times 1, okay? So what is this hazard then? The hazard of the patients who had placebo is four times five times four point five times compared to patients who had the treatment. Okay, patients who had placebo have four point five times hazard for leukemia compared to the patients who had the treatment. Right, so that means the survival is higher for the treatment group. Hazard is lower for the treatment. Hazard is higher for the placebo group means survival is lower for the placebo group. Four times five, four point five times hazard, right? So that's the fall. How many times, right? So that's that's a huge number actually, right? Four point five times hazard compared to the others, placebo group, right? Not twice, not three times. It's four point five times. Okay, so very. So the placebo group is in high danger compared to the treatment set. Is that clear to all of you? Have you explained the hazard ratio? Okay. And the other thing you, you have to look at is the confidence interval for the hazard. The 95% confidence interval for the hazard. Let me use another color. Right. Now look at this confidence interval. 2.0.27 2. 
So where is 1? 1 is somewhere here, right? Now tell me hazard ratio 1. What does that mean? 1 to 1 ratio. Is there a difference? If you have hazard ratio 1, is there a difference? No, right? 1 to 1 ratio means both are same. Right? So if your hazard ratio is close to 1, that means there's no, actually there's no significant difference in the hazard. Right? But here 4.5 when the confidence interval is from 2 point something to 10 point something, it's clearly that 1 is not inside the interval. Right? So 1 is not inside the interval clearly says that this hazard ratio is significant. Right? So if your confidence interval for the hazard contains 1, that means that hazard ratio is not significant and it will be close to 1 usually. Right? So there's no significant difference in the hazards between the two groups. But in this case, the confidence interval does not contain one. That means at 5% alpha, this hazard ratio is significant and that hazard is four times, right? Four times, 4.5 times actually compared to the, or between the two groups. Okay? So those are the things you check when you get the output. You look at the coefficient, you look at the hazard, check whether the coefficient is significant, Usually, if the coefficient is significant, the hazard ratio is also significant. That means the confidence interval for the hazard does not contain 1. Okay? Usually, if the coefficient is not significant, usually the hazard ratio, the confidence interval contains 1. Right? So, we'll look at the other models one by one and see what happens. Okay? Right. So, for the model 1, the information that you can get from the output. Is it clear to all of you? How you interpret? How you get these numbers? Is that clear to all of you? Fine. Right. Now shall we go to the second model? We'll, we'll look at the second model and finish for today and we'll continue it starting from there next time. Right. But let's look at the model too. Right. Now, your model 2 contains two covariates, treatment and the log WBC. Log WBC is not a categorical variable, it's continuous, okay? You have the coefficients. So, that means this is beta 1 hat, this is beta 2 hat. Are they significant? Are they significant? Are the coefficients significant? Look at the p-value. Both of them are very small, less than 0 0.05. So both coefficients are significant. Right? Now look at the hazard ratios. Now you know how to calculate it. To take e to the power 1.294, you get this hazard ratio. If you get e to the power 1.604, you will get this 4.975. Check it. Okay, can you get it? And then the confidence interval, right? Again, you know how to get the confidence interval. Standard errors are there, right? Standard errors are there for Rx and log WBC. You can easily construct the confidence interval for the coefficient and from that, taking it to the power 95% confidence interval for the uh, hazard ratio, right? Again, assume normality, take say z, so 1.96. Now look at the confidence interval, the first one for Rx. Does that interval contain one? Does this interval contain one? No, it does not contain one, yes, right? So what does that mean? This hazard ratio is significant. So 
uh, same for the second one, right? 2.6 up to 9.4. So one is outside the confidence interval. So the hazard ratio for log WBC is also significant. Now, how do you interpret this 3.6448? You have two variables now, right? This 3.648 is the coefficient, the e to the power beta 1 hat. That means beta 2 hat is not there, it's gone. What does that mean? You are comparing same log WBC values. It's like you control log WBC value, right? So if you consider all the patients who have same log WBC value, right? If you have set of patients who have the same log WBC value, right? The placebo group had 3.6 times hazard compared to treatment, right? So that is when log WBC is, com is controlled. All of them have the same log WBC. That's how you interpret. Then when you interpret the log, log WBC one, how do you how do you use that? That is with the reference one to zero, right? Usually with the numerical examples, we can't just use this four point nine seven five, right? Because uh, you have to multiply the coefficient with whatever the log WBC value of that patient, right? So therefore, usually it's not easy to explain 4.975 for a continuous variable only, right? But if you compare two patients with two different log WBC values, you can get a proper hazard ratio, okay? So you can use this hazard ratio to compare categorical variables, comparing groups, but for continuous variables, it's hard to use this 4.975 as it is, but you can compare two patients, maybe in the same group or other groups, you know, using that equation, properly uh, substituting the given log WBC value and given treatment group, then you can get the exact hazard ratio, right? Not like this one. This is just log WBC one to zero, right? It's not that much meaningful, okay? But you can explain the hazard ratio of Rx. Okay. So that is how you uh, check the models. Right? So we'll go to the uh, model 3 and the, uh, the rest of the comparisons next time. So that means we are going to use this log likelihood value. See? This log likelihood value, you can see they are changing over the models. So that is the value that we are going to compare the models, model 1 to model 2. Right? So what is the difference between model and model 2? Model 2 has extra variable. So if you want to check whether model 1 is better or model 2 is better or model 3 is better, we are going to use this log likelihood value. Right? So I'll show you the test statistic and how to write the hypothesis and all. And then let's continue with the rest uh, from this. Okay? So up to now, now you know how to write the Cox pH model uh, by looking at the output, what are the components of the output, how do you interpret the output, how do you check the significant, all these things now you know. Right? So the next time we'll try to do the comparisons in detail with writing hypothesis and writing the uh, test statistic and then how to make the conclusion. Uh, okay, so you need, all right, okay, I'll uh, upload the recording. Mm. Uh, with the LMS, do you, I don't think you have free data. Do you have free data? Or is it, do you want me to upload it to YouTube? Which one is better? From the LMS, when you have to download the video, do you, do you have to spend data? Or is it free? I'm, I'm not sure. No. YouTube better? I know there are several, you know, packages with YouTube unlimited, right? Okay, then I'll upload the video to my YouTube channel and I'll send you the link, okay? Um, I'll try to do it now, if not within two days, okay? Right, okay, any other questions? Okay, then I, I don't think the trade union action is going to continue tomorrow and afterwards. Anyway, let's see. 
If it is there, I'll do the online lessons. If not, we'll meet in person on Thursday. Okay. So since I'm uploading the recording, I'm not uploading the lecture note because I'll upload it uh, with this example when we finish it, okay? The whole uh, example I'll upload. There are several other pages to discuss. After we complete the example, I'll upload it. Okay? Until then, I'll only upload the uh, video recording, okay?